Namaste. So the Kata Upanishad is a dialogue with death. The meaning of Kata, with the dot under the T, uh, the ordinary Kata without the dot means like stories, pastimes, uh, instructions even, or things that were done, you know, like histories in the past. But kata, <laughs> with the dot underneath it, and when it's pronounced properly, <laughs> it means distress. I had to dig deep into the Sanskrit dictionaries to find this. It means distress, but it's also a name of Shiva. So Shiva is death. I mean, uh, according to the Puranas, death, Yamaraj, is the son of the sun god, Vivasvan. So he is often called Vivasvan or Vivasvata. And that has the implication of being all-pervading. Because just like the sun, death is everywhere, wherever life is, and we find life everywhere. It's said, death is born along with your birth. And what does that mean? Well, the body is temporary. All bodies are temporary. All form has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And when it's over, it comes under the purview of death. So what is death exactly? What does it mean? How does it work? Well, these are natural questions that I think everybody has from childhood, from the time of uh, recognizing death and its inevitability. One wants to know what's going to happen to me, isn't it? So the story opens with a boy at his father's sacrifice. And he sees some irregularity in the sacrifice. And so he offers himself to be given, to be sacrificed. And the father says, I send you unto death. So he wants to make his father's word good. You know, remember, this is, this is not about ordinary people in Kali Yuga. <laughs> this is about people of extremely high character and integrity. Even though they get angry sometimes and say things they might regret, still their uh, sons and daughters especially are or should be committed to making sure their words are true. So anyway, Nachiketas, the boy, offers himself as a sacrifice and he gets sent to death. And it's not really described in the Upanishad how that happens, but uh, one scene closes and the next opens in the house of death. And death is away. Doesn't say what he's doing. He has some business. You know, I, I doubt that he takes a vacation, <laughs> uh, at least in this material world. It seems like death is everywhere. So when he returns, he begins a dialogue a dialogue with death. And he asks death these questions, these deep, searching, fundamental questions about, you know, what is life? What is death? What is consciousness? What is being itself? And how to deal with it, how to uh, make ourselves actually immune to death. And of course, the, the secret, the Buddha would tell you in a second, the secret is not being born. <laughs> if you're not born, you don't die, period. Because death is a feature, not a bug, of the gross material body, the anamaya kosha. So the anamaya kosha is temporary because all gross matter decays. It burns, it oxidizes, it literally burns up uh, by the influence of the sun, 
it's a nice sunny morning today, so I thought I'd come out here. Uh, it's a beautiful day. But uh, every day, the sun, as it goes around, reduces our lifespan by one day. Isn't it? So that's why in Jyotish, in Vedic astrology, the sun is viewed as an inauspicious planet. <laughs> because it takes away our life day by day. Huh? And so the son of the sun is Yama, death. That makes sense, right? If the son is the one who's reducing our lifespan, then death would be his son. So the son of the sun meets the son of Gotama. And they have a conversation that just, I mean, <laughs> it goes so deep and so far into the mysteries of life and being and consciousness, especially, uh, that I just had to, when I came across this, from the very beginning, I had the desire to present it, you know, as a series. But it's tough. It's hard. This series is not going to be easy. We're going to have to go deep into the Sanskrit. We're going to have to analyze each and every word and get its real meaning. And fortunately, we have guidance. We have the commentary of Shankaracharya. Now, Shankaracharya is probably the preeminent Advaita teacher and practitioner. I mean, you can't teach what you don't have, right? So, in his very short, way too short uh, lifespan, he authored many books, and one of them was a commentary on this very Kata Upanishad. Kata Upanishad. You have to pronounce the T properly. It's not Kata, it's Kata. Uh, kata Upanishad. So uh, Kata Upanishad is one of those Upanishads that goes deep into non-duality, into the nature of Brahman, the nature of being, the nature of consciousness, and, of course, the nature of bliss. Now, we're presenting this in parallel with the Shiva Sahasranama, the thousand holy names of Shiva. So, what do the two have to do with each other? Well, before we talked about, I mean, in the early days of this channel, we talked about existentialism and being in the world, and that's the preliminary stage. Then we talked about rituals and mantras and that kind of external devotional service. Uh, then we talked about bhakti, specifically bhakti to the mother, to the goddess Shakti. And that brought us to Shiva. And Shiva is meditation. You always see him in the forest seated in meditation. And what does this mean? It means that Shiva is non-duality. If religious rituals and so on represent Jagrat consciousness, consciousness of the external world, and bhakti or devotion represents svapna consciousness or dream consciousness, then Shiva represents sushupti or deep sleep, the emptiness, the nothingness, the goal of all authentic meditation, huh? to stop the mind, to stop words and thinking, uh, to stop speculating, to stop desire and the formation of thoughts that lead to becoming. So the end of becoming is the beginning of real being. And this is self-realization. This is Brahman. But Brahman is known only to those who have passed the tests of religion, of devotion, of meditation, and finally develop devotion for Shiva. Uh, because Shiva is Yama. Who else, see, is Kata? The dictionary is very, very terse on this point. Two definitions. One, distress. Two, a name of Shiva. That's it. 
No long explanation given. None needed. <laughs> it's quite clear. We get distress from death because we cling to life. And the harder we cling to life, that is, the existence of the gross body, the anamaya kosha, the more we suffer, the more distress we feel when it has to go away. What's the cure? Well, sadhana is the gateway. Sadhana is the path that leads us away from the gross body to identify with the subtle bodies, the antakarana, the internal organs, the pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnana maya kosha, and ananda maya kosha, the four components of the subtle body. See, the linga sharira, that's it's called. And, of course, the shiva linga, there's a connection between that and the shiva linga, because when you dive down deep in the heart, and I don't mean the physical heart, I mean the spiritual heart on the right side of the chest, and you come down to the root of the mind and the origin of consciousness, you find, uh, as Buddha found, when he investigated this, that there's a Shiva Lingam there. There's something transcendental. See, the Shiva Lingam is the symbol of the great Lingam, the Mahalingam, that manifested in the beginning of the universe to Brahma and Vishnu when they were fighting. This was Shiva putting an end to their conflict by saying, hey, you guys, there's something bigger than you all. <laughs> Because neither of them could find the top or the bottom. He is beyond the material universe from the beginning. Because he is the origin of the material universe. He's the origin of Maya. Huh? He creates Shakti according to his desire. So what happens in the world is not our desire huh? or the way the world is made. It's not our desire. It's his desire. Kata, right? He makes the material body temporary so that we don't identify with duality, so that we can't, because we are all aspects of him. And he wants us to be salvageable. He wants us to be rescuable. He wants to be able to liberate us, because that's the fifth divine function, compassion blessing, anugraha, which is the giving of liberation. And Shiva reserves that right for himself alone, although he does share it with demigods such as uh, Vishnu and Yama. So Yama can give liberation if we become his friend. And to do that, we have to pass his tests. And we're going to hear all about this in this Upanishad, how Nachiketash passed all the tests of death and was awarded the highest knowledge that leads to complete self-realization and liberation. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.